Good afternoon, everybody. It's 4 p.m., so let me start another talk on kernel tracing with eBPF. My name is Stanislav Kozina. I work for Red Hat. This will be very gentle introduction in kernel tracing with eBPF. There won't be any details. Um, so those who are interested in learning something more up to date, what, what is the latest development on upstream, please stay for the next talk, which will be our little talk of BTF that will go into a bit more details. This is really just just introduction. What what we have as of today, um, but very brief. Um, so what is eBPF? It's much easier to say what is not. It's not just bucket filter. That's a good start. Um, it's pretty interesting that if you talk to some people who are using eBPF, um, we have made some observation that they either talk about networking use cases or some tracing. And there is very little overlap between the two. So we are um, trying to point out that eBPF is like whole ecosystem, which, which is fairly powerful. And it's, it's not easy to have a like elevator pitch talk about what, what is eBPF. So it's, there are either a bunch of networking features. It basically allows you to receive all network flows directly from the network interfaces and do some uh, very quick analysis of these packets, modify their content, drop them, or do any, uh, anything you want on, on the network flows before it enters the Linux stack. But it's not the Linux stack bypass. You can still choose to like forward these packets further to uh, to the Linux network stack, uh, or all or it's it also provides a lot of tracing features, because you can use these eBPF programs to basically hook to K probes, trace points, uh, trace events, and all all these allow you to like get any information out of the kernel uh, uh, you might want. So basically. You can already achieve all of this using kernel modules, but a lot of people don't like entering their own kernel modules to their kernel, and sometimes you might need to recompile the kernel modules. So eBPF is like a safer way to achieve a lot of things you could otherwise achieve, uh, achieve with kernel modules, but without kernel modules. Uh, there's a lot of safety mechanisms, so eBPF program programs should, should not be able to like harm your kernel. It should, be, it should be safe. So in this talk, I won't be talking about networking features. Not at all, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it might be easier to just start with an example. So uh, imagine you have your server, which is like 80 different disks, and all of these disks are fully busy, and you need to figure out why. What application is causing the I.O. to go down to the disks so the disks are just spinning and, and, and overloaded? And obviously, it's not just any application which is doing the most I.O. Because if you're on applications such as like copy dev 0 to dev now, it's all in, in memory. So this copy is causing a lot of I.O., but it's not going down to the disks. So this is, this is not the guilty application, right? And these days, it's fairly easy. On like current Linux distributions such as Fedora, you just install BCC tools, and you run a tool called Biotop. And that will very quickly tell you what applications are, uh, are causing the real I.O. going down to the disks. So if I'm running another command, which is just copying all my physical drive to devnow. So I'm reading all of the content of the physical drive. In Biotop, uh, I will quickly see that there is a DD, which is just running as much IO as possible. And there's a little bit of deencrypt because um, my disk was encrypted, I suppose. And there is Biotop, which is a little surprising, but probably is doing some IO. Um, so it's created. Um, it's a Python script, which is cool. We all love Python, and it's perfect. Like Python for, for kernel programming, that's like <laughs> what all kernel programmers would like to see, right? Um, not the case. <laughs> it's a Python script which contains embedded C code, which is actually, uh, that C code is used to collect all these data out of the kernel, and it's just passed up to the user land, where you can do some post-processing of, the, of these data in Python. It's a great advantage. You have the Python wrapper, or even Lua wrapper, on top of, of on top of this information, because in Python it's fairly easy to like transform the information further and pass them anywhere you might want. So like typical setup might might look like you're running BPF program in your kernel. That gives you some information about the kernel, aggregated, aggregated information. You can use your BPF programs to basically like monitor all network packets and just give you some statistics about like what's the average size of the packet or how many drops there are, and you don't need to create any new kernel interfaces. And after you collect this, this aggregated information and you pass them to useland, in Python you can just convert them to JSON and upload them to your databases. So you can have some like data center analytics which is running all the graphs and anytime there's some like sudden 
blink somewhere on one of the thousands machines you, you, you can immediately see and and you know you can have some analytics built in uh, in python um, so what's done with the c code is that there is another library library i will talk a bit further in detail uh, which is called bcc and this library is actually using lvm libraries to get its c code compiled in something we we call bpf bytecode. So how it looks overall. On the left side, you have your user -led application, you have your C code in that application, then one is being passed to LVM compiler, LVM compiler compiles the BPA bytecode, um, that is from the user -led application being passed through the BPF syscall to the kernel, there's running a verifier which makes sure that um, your bytecode is safe, it will always terminate, it, uh, it's done it is doing a lot of checks, and some of them I don't understand that much. For example, it's checking for unreachable instructions, which, which is not harmful, right? But anyway, it's checking for unreachable instructions. So it will make sure that your code is nice and safe. Then the code is actually executed by the BPF runtime. Usually it's even jitted before it's executed. So, so there's a like, very simple JIT compiler which translates your BPF bytecode to your real architecture instructions. And these instructions are executed. These BPF programs can be attached to various points, um, some of the networking points, such as like XDP hooks and uh, sockets. But it can, in our case, for tracing, it can also be attached to K probes, trace points, and perf events. So you can collect information from, from, from these events. Uh, you can as part of your BPF program, you can do the analysis of these information. So if it's a, like sometimes it's just too much in kernel, so you can quickly do some aggregations, and just, just as a result of these aggregations, uh, can be passed back to the uh, user space. You have two recommended ways how to pass the information. One is through perf event buffers, which are like per CPU, very quick buffers, uh, which can be used to just, just pass anything you want. Or uh, there are some special constructions which are called eBPF maps, which are basically like Python dictionaries. You can map anything you want to anything you want, and it can be accessed from both kernel and user space. So you can, you can still use this to, to pass information. But I suppose it would be slower than the perf even buffers, because with perf even buffers, it's just ma mapped memory per CPU. Um, so how the biotype <coughs> is really created, uh, what this C code, which is used as a BPF program, needs to do. It hooks to several places in the kernel. Uh, it hooks to some block functions uh, using k-probes. One of these are uh, block account io start. I don't know the black layout, but I trust that they know what they are doing. So probably this function is used to track any time an application receives some io operation, like read or write. Then there is another function, uh, block mq start request, which af um, so the application issues the request. The request is queued until the disk has some time which, uh, where, uh, when it can actually handle the I.O. So block MQ start request is when it actually starts the request. And then block account I.O. completion is the notification that the request was, uh, was finished. So what the application needs to do is that anytime block account I.O. start is called, that means some application is doing I.O. So we need to put down what application is doing this I.O. Then in block MQ start request, we actually timestamp when, when this I.O. starts. And then in block account I.O. completion is called. That's when we do another timestamp. We measure how long it took and we account for this application that this is the time it took the application to handle I.O. And we just sum it all together and then we sort. And that's how we build a list of applications causing the most I.O. operations on disks. Um, so I mentioned that this is all done. Uh, all the Biotop tool is done using is our BPF compiler collection, which is BCC, which is the library, which is simplifying the, uh, the work with LVM. It also provides a couple of other hooks, uh, such as it loads your program to the kernel, it reads the output from the kernel, uh, it provides a Python binding, which simplifies like um, how you read the data and how you can uh, actually print it, and etc. cetera. Um, currently, it's, uh, it's good to note that any time you actually run the Biotop tool, the C code is compiled. The Python code is not compiled, but, but a C code is compiled on execution. So uh, this works around for problems like 
what if I'm running my code on a different version of kernel than it was developed on? Uh, so you just try to compile, and if the kernel would be so much different from the one you've wrote to get the application for, uh, very likely the, uh, the BPM program would refuse to load because the verifier might might check that you are accessing some offsets which are just not, uh, which do not exist in this kernel, for example. Uh, as a part of this BCC library, there's also a huge set of tools such as Biotop. There are like 100 more tools, and these serve as pretty good examples about what you can do with BCC. But these are also uh, they are fairly useful uh, on their own, such as Biotop. I can't think of another way how to like achieve what you can do with Biotop without Biotop, right? It's it's pretty unique. You could probably do the same with kernel module, system tab, and other kernel tracing features, but Biotop is just already created a tool which you just run. You don't need to configure anything and, and, and it gives you the data. Um, I already mentioned system tab. System tab is a traditional kernel tracing tool which works in a way that you write what you want to trace in some special system tab higher, lang uh, higher level language. Traditionally, this has been compiled into a kernel module, which is pushed to the kernel, and the kernel module uses k-probes to collect the information and, and do the analytics. But with the BPF, you can basically do the same with BPF. So there is a new runtime for system tab since version 3.2, uh, which has stopped BPF. The idea is that like, you would run system tab as you do normally, uh, <coughs> but you just issue one more option, which is runtime BPF, and that will tell system tab that instead of building a kernel module, it should it should build a BPF code actually and try to run this using BPF. Um, this is fairly new. I think this was finished like half a year ago. Um, it works in a concept, uh, but many of the system tab features are yet not supported with the BPF runtime. Uh, I was trying it yesterday and what I was missing probably the most uh, are a bunch of functions which you have in system tab, such as give me the current thread ID, give me the current CPU ID, give me the current name of the process uh, and, and all of these. They, they just fail to compile with, with the BPF runtime. Um, and there are some other options which you can use. Uh, there's BPF trace, which I would like to show in the remaining one minute. Um, BPF trace is another like, high level tracing language which, where you can define what you want to trace. It doesn't need debug info because when you compile on execution, you can just put the header files there, you can compile the header files, that's how you build the debug information you would need for your program. It also uses LVM, it also uses VCC to simplify uh, what it's doing. It's actually using Cl uh, Clank to compile the C header files. So you can just include your Linux kernel header files to get the structures you, you want to work with, and then you can access them from, from BPF trace. Um, it has access to all these like A probes, C probes, trace points, profiling functions, um, it's, uh, and it also has the aggregations. Uh, so if you want to aggregate the data in the kernel before you pass them to userland, so it's fast, you just call a uh, few of these functions uh, and that's it. Uh, it has about 50,000 K probes, which means that you can hook at most of kernel functions. Um, so this is just a very quick example about how a BPF trace code would look like. There's one K probe defined, which is the sysread, which means uh, which is the syscall handler for, for read. I save there, nsex is a variable which is the current timestamp. I save that, uh, I store that in uh, like associative array which is indexed by the current thread ID. Then I have the same probe but for the return probe, so when this function uh, terminates, I do the same basically. So here I get the, uh, the new timestamp, I subtract the start timestamp, and I push this into a histogram, and then I delete the start timestamp. So this is fairly simple. It should take you like one minute to write code like this. And the result is that, uh, let me show you. Um, uh, yeah. So when you do some IO, it will draw a very nice histogram of like how long it in average took to handle the read syscall. So you can see that there have been like, I don't know, 25,000, 30,000 syscalls. And in average, they took, uh, the, the size of the read was like less than 1, 1K. And I have some more examples about BPF trace, but we ran out of time. 
So we have about four minutes for questions. We have almost 10 minutes for questions. So I can, if the question is, can you show the other example, I can show the other example. <laughs> Looks like we don't have any questions. So I can show the other example. Uh, the other example I have was that I would like to show you the, the Biotop tool I talked about uh, uh, at the beginning. So as I said, it's a, it's a Python script which imports the BCC Python library. Then there is the C code, which is this one. It defines a couple of BPF maps. Then right here, it actually attaches a bunch of the C functions to given K probes. And here are the functions which are actually handling this. So this is where they are storing the timestamp in some, uh, in some BPF hash. And here they, they are handling the completion. So when, when IO terminates, this function is called where they look up if they if we have the start the starting timestamp of this IO. If not, we return. Otherwise, we just get the current timestamp. We subtract it somewhere I don't know where. Um, and this is used for collecting the information. You can see this that all this code has about 230 lines of code. Most of it is Python, but about half of it is uh, is C. While you can achieve something similar with BPF trace, fairly simpler. Um, so instead, with BPF trace, you could write this. Um, in block account I'll start, you just put down the current command so you know who is executing this command. Then in start request and MQ start request, you store the, the current timestamp. In account IO completion, you again subtract the current timestamp from the starting timestamp. You sum it all together using BPF trace function sum and you clean up uh, the, the starting timestamps. And then I'm running just <coughs> one second intervals where I'm reporting who's currently uh, causing most of the file. So if I run this, uh, chips, it's like once per second, it's printing all processes which are causing some IO. So when I cause some IO, That's interesting. Oh, there is. That's it. So you should see that DD is currently causing a lot of file. And before my laptop starts to overheat, that's it. So with BPF trace, you can kind of get the same information in about 30 lines of code, which is much simpler and faster than just developing it with, with BCC, right? So BPF trace is your tool to, like, figure out what is happening in the kernel very quickly. And like, it took me, I, I was just playing with it <coughs> yesterday's night and it took me like 15 minutes to put it down basically. It just, it just very, very quick. So is BCC just the old way to do this stuff or? No, I, uh, so both are covered by, by IOVisor, both okay. BCC and. Can you repeat the question? Oh, thank you. Uh, the question is, so BCC is just the old way to do the tracing and BPF trace is the new version. Mm -hmm. And I think, no, uh, both of these projects are covered by uh, IOVisor project. BCC is older, but I think uh, they are not like immediate replacements because in BCC, because you can do the Python post-processing, you can do whatever you want in Python. You can actually collect data and feed them to your monitoring systems. So I see BCC more for like creation of production tools which are using BP, uh, BPF, while BPF trace is just for playing. Like or like system analysis. I need now. To, I need right now. Need to know what what's happening on in my kernel, and you use it and you drop it. Any more questions? The question is if I need to be a root to like run all these tools. There is an option in upstream to not be root, but 
Using BPF, you have access to all kernel information, including all keys, all other containers, all virtual machines, everything, all users, very likely root password. Yes, you really, your distribution should be restricted for root only. Because right now, as far as I know, there's no limitation of BPF to, for example, just one namespace or something like this. You just have access to like... For, with this type of program, of programs that are <coughs> used by tracing, uh, there is a restriction. Uh, so the, uh, basically, yes, the, you, you have to be root in order to run uh, these uh, types of BPF yeah. programs. So I noticed that you have to be root for tracing. Okay, we have three more minutes, so one more example. Um, one more example is ICMP trace. So this is even simpler. Um, this, this is actually something I would recommend using if, if you don't know all kernel and you just need to know what functions are being called. Uh, this is something, what, what do you would do? So I'm tracing all ICMP functions and anytime any function which has the ICMP, with, which starts with ICMP prefix, I'll just print the name of that function. And there's a return probe for all these functions as well. So I will just find that this function is terminated. And just for fun, for one of these functions, which is ICMP receive, I know that the first argument of ICMP receive is <coughs> um, a socket buffer of the packet which was just received. So I'll print the pointer to the socket buffer. So if you run this. Uh -huh. And then you receive some packets. You basically get a trace of your RCMP stack. It's, you can do the same with ftrace, but what is nice here that for ICMP receive, after you uncomment it, you can quickly get the arguments for selecting functions where you know what the uh, what the what the arguments of the functions are you can you can just quickly trace them so this is a very very easy way if you if you know there is some problem in the kernel happening under some conditions you basically this is how you get to that point that only if these arguments of this functions uh, function are being used then i need to know the call stack the arguments of the nested functions and etc uh, you can also use guards so typically what what you could do is that when any thread runs these functions with these arguments then just trace everything so I, so you would see the the call path of this thread after it met given given conditions and we have one more minute one question what about the overhead like when you're using code something like this and experience physics the question is what about overhead uh, there is overhead. I would say that this is probably the most effective way how you can do this because so how, what, what the real overhead is that you have the kernel code. After you attach some K probe to this, to this function, just the first byte of that function is replaced by some trap, I think. Yeah, so like, like jump somewhere else. And most of these functions are like 20, 30 instructions. So basically for each traced functions, if you execute code like, like this one, you should expect like 20 more instructions per probe. And as I said, they are jitted. So these are like native instructions and it's fairly effective because it's compiled with LVM. It's just, just normal compilation, normal code. So there will be a, a, probably the biggest overhead is that because you have to jump someplace totally else, there will be a different cache line, very likely. So that might be the, the, the biggest uh, performance hit. The, the use based communication doesn't have to slow anything down. It's anyway, somehow buffer somewhere. Yeah. Right? So if you use the perf buffers, the, it's just the shared memory between kernel and user land per CPU. So it's just the kernel, after your program terminates, it puts some data in a perf buffer, and user land just reads it from memory and, and prints. There's like no syscalls. If it doesn't manage to keep up, the buffer will just run over or something. Uh, I think it's ring buffer, so it will just start or, overriding. Yeah, like, you, you <laughs> won't see some messages. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. 
So we are out of time. Thank you very much.